Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with WDSC, WRPT in Duluth, Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Dale Patterson, CEO of the Lake Superior Community Health Center. Dale has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Dale, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Talk about the mission of the organization and how you ensure that people in the Duluth area have really good and holistic health. Lake Superior Community Health Center has been around since 1972. We started as a free clinic in the basement of the Sacred Heart Church. Um, our mission has not changed. What we do and how we do it has changed a lot over those 50 years, but our mission has not changed. And that is to make sure that everyone has access to certain primary health care, um, regardless of ability to pay. So we started as a free clinic with primarily volunteer providers and donated supplies, um, and we've grown over the years. We added dental services, uh, we've expanded to add behavioral health. We have a clinic now in Duluth and one in, and two clinics in Superior. We offer primary medical, dental, behavioral health, and in Wisconsin we also add, um, offer substance abuse services. So what our mission is is to make sure that everyone can have access to health regardless of ability to pay. We have a sliding fee scale, we have fully integrated care, and we're very intentionally inclusive, reaching out to groups of people who are frequently marginalized in our society to make sure that they know we're here and that they feel welcome coming to us. There's a values-based and a philosophical element to this. Mm -hmm. Whether it comes from one value tradition or another, it really is about how you see society. How do you see a healthy city? Could you talk a little bit about how the, the people who support you, the people on the board, people on staff, your volunteers, how do they see a healthy region? Right. Well, the interesting thing is, is that we're a community health center or what's called a federally qualified health center. Mm -hmm. FQHCs have their roots in the, civil, in the civil rights movement from the 1960s. So a physician by the name of Dr. Jack Geiger had done some traveling and came back to the United States and said, there's this concept of having a community health center embedded in the community and that health should, should revolve around and emanate from that idea that as a community, we should care for each other. And through the Johnson War on Poverty, was able to get funding for the first two community health centers. So it's all rooted in this idea that health is a basic civil right. And it's a community. And it's, it's a, a community, community. That our community should rally around people. And so there is a there is a feeling among, among federally qualified health centers, community health centers, that is all about the patient. Our board of directors is comprised of at least 51% of our board must be patient members of our board. Um, we have um, a lot of initiatives that focus on patient feedback and making sure that we're being, as I said, intentionally inclusive. And the whole concept is what does our community need? We regularly and routinely conduct needs assessments to see what our community needs. So there's that idea that we're here to serve the community, tell us what you need, and then can we figure out a way to do that? And in their initial um, a manifestation. Uh, these health centers, these clinics, were really about physical health, but right. now it's a much more holistic piece, right? right? And it's not only physical and mental health, whether there's a division there is is, is debatable, right? It's, it's all one person, but it's also things like uh, preventive and diet and, and uh, attitude and and uh, how one behaves. Right. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how, how uh, you see that aspect? Because it's not just giving a shot or, or, um, or fixing an injured arm, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's much more. Right, so um, we really do believe that patient-centered care, whole person-focused care recognizes that what happens in your head, your mental health, is connected to what happens in your teeth, your oral health, is connected to what happens in your heart and in your liver and in your spleen and, and your, your pancreas. Your, your, your diet, Absolutely. your exercise. They're all connected, right? There's really interesting research coming out having to do with some of the trauma-informed movement and other kinds of studies that are showing that um, there is as much impact on physical health of social isolation as there is on smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Social isolation, so social isolation meaning that you are staying in your home, you're staying in whatever your shelter is, 
you are not communicating with other people and that actually has a physical manifestation. Right, so the great thing about um, Lake Spirit Community Health Center is that we have this integrated care, right? So if you come to our clinic, you can see a medical provider for primary care. You can also see the dentist. Those two people can actually speak to each other. We share a common medical record. Um, if you have a behavioral health condition, you can see a behavioral health clinician. And again, those providers are gonna speak with each other and work together to treat the whole patient. Um, and so it really is that idea that everything has to be in alignment. Everything has to be considered for health to be whole. How do your, uh, your dentists, your doctors, your nurses, how does this um, affect the way they interact with one another as a team? So I have a couple of examples that I think will answer your question. So we had a patient recently in our dental department needed um, some dental work done in, before the patient could have some very important um, medical intervention for a very serious, potentially life-threatening disease. Uh, ended up in our dental chair, blood pressure so out of control that it was not safe to treat the patient. So our dentists recognize that if we can't get the blood pressure under control, we can't do the dental work. If we can't do the dental work, they can't engage in the therapy they need to treat this life-threatening disease. So sent the patient up to see one of our primary care providers was able to get the blood pressure under control. So in fact, the dental procedure could, could go on. Um, and we have all kinds of examples of that, is that we, we, we can't see these things as discrete, um, factors, but we have to take a look at how it impacts the patient as a whole. What's really interesting is that we're getting back to, through these uh, FQHCs, we're getting back to a concept of medicine that we kind of lost when we moved into this sort of science-based yep. specialization, right? Right. Remember, for some of us who grew up in rural America, like I did, remember the old family physician? The, the doctor with the, yeah, with exactly. the, like the black bag and right. would open up like this. Yep. And there would, yes. We had Dr. Palmer when I was growing up. I think he thought penicillin cured everything because I remember getting a lot of that. But, you know, he treated me from the time I was a baby until I was in high school, knows everything about you, knows everything about right. you. And I'm not saying there was never a time that they sent you to see a specialist, but there was that whole person approach. They knew your mm -hmm. family history. History. They treated your family, and so you know we've we've come so far as you say in these silos where we have people who thank heaven specialize in things like neurosurgery and um, orthopedics and rheumatology. We're glad to have those specialists, but we've lost some of that idea that it's an integrated approach. You get also to the uh, with the over specialization, you you uh, lose so much. So for example, if you take a look at the heart and then the vascular system. And then you take a look at the pulmonary, pulmonary system, the, 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 the whole uh, breathing apparatus that you have. You take a look at, at neurology. Um, all of these elements, you know, connective tissue is, is ubiquitous. All of these elements actually exist together. To the extent that we're talking about point solutions, we get really, really bad impacts. Nowhere is that more obvious than through the uh, the problem of addiction that we have, mm -hmm. where uh, people are being prescribed um, uh, uh, drugs that because of a lack of communication amongst people, uh, others in the profession, uh, prescriptions are, uh, uh, certain substances are being over-prescribed and that creates other harms like mm -hmm. the opioid addiction. Mm -hmm. So we, we do provide outpatient substance abuse services in our Wisconsin program and we have a medication assisted treatment program mm -hmm. where we can provide people Suboxone in conjunction with other services. Um, the majority of the time, the, the patients that we're serving in that population have other um, co-occurring disorders. It might be a mental health issue, it might be a primary care issue. So you talk about, for example, how do we treat the whole patient? Let's talk about someone who has a long-term addiction to meth, for example. Meth is extremely hard on teeth and, and it causes severe um, degradation of the Erosion, teeth. Erosion, right. So let's, let's talk about someone who has made the Herculean effort to get off methamphetamines because it's a tough road. And they do, and now they want to go get a job. How do they get a job if they if they have 
a mouthful of teeth that, that make them not presentable in a customer service kind of world. So um, our ability to understand how those things interplay and how maybe getting a patient dentures or um, some type of corrective uh, uh, dental procedures um, could have a significant impact on their ability to complete and successfully maintain the work that they've done in a substance abuse program because gainful employment is going to have a s significant impact and you can't be gainfully employed if you are not fitting a certain societal mold about your appearance. And if you take a look at the, at the competencies and, and how that splits up uh, of your 99 uh, uh, people, um, mm -hmm. how many are in different uh, disciplines? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have um, about, about five medical providers, not all full-time, mm -hmm. um, seven dentists, um, nine behavioral health providers, three substance abuse providers, and then we have um, dental assistants and medical assistants and right. hygienists and, and so on and so forth. So um, approximately th about 40% of the services that we provide are primary medical, 20% mm -hmm. um, or so are behavioral health and the rest are, are dental. And how are you funded? So we have multiple sources of funding. Um, our, our primary payer is going to be Medicaid. We serve a lot of persons who are enrolled in the Medicaid program. Uh, we also serve persons on Medicare, so we have, we have that funding. We receive what's called a Federal 330 grant, which is offered to federally qualified health centers. Um, because we offer people a sliding fee scale, if they meet income guidelines and they're either uninsured or underinsured. So that federal grant helps support us in the provision of care. We're also really fortunate to have some great local funders. We've had many years of funding from the Ordeen Foundation, from Duluth CDBG, um, the United Way. Uh, we recently received a grant from the Miller Dwan Foundation to support a, a brand new program to provide free telephonic mental health support to farmers and their families because of the crisis of mental health and, and the unfortunate increase in suicides among farmers and their families. If you were to look further out five years and 10 years, how do you see the organization evolving over the next, let's say, 10 year horizon? I happen to have children who are young adults and they won't communicate with me unless I text them. So I think one of the things we have to, to ask ourselves is what is the communication style that the next generation is going to insist on? So I think there will be lots of changes dictated by the people who are using the system. Um, as you get older and you have more chronic conditions, that face-to-face -face appointment with a provider, that personal relationship with the provider starts to become more important. If you're in your um, late teens, if you're in your 20s and your 30s and you're fortunate to be a really healthy young adult, your um, interaction with the healthcare system is much more episodic. And for those individuals, what's gonna matter to them is how can I get seen really quickly? Can I make the appointment on my phone? Will someone even talk to me over the app? Can I do it on my lunch hour? And, and we have to be thoughtful about that. What are the ways we connect with different people at different points in their life that's, that is appropriate to the type of care they're asking for or that they need? So it's customer responsive uh, provision of health care. It's, right. it's customer responsive, it's patient responsive. Dale Patterson, thank you so much for sharing all the great work of the Lake Superior Community Health Center, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me.